Let's do an example of how a lessor would account for a lease under IFRS 16 when there's a guaranteed residual value. So let's say that the lessor is a manufacturer or a dealer, and we've got a three-year lease. The lessor's implicit interest rate is 5%. Okay, so that is what is going to be used for any discounting when we do our present value calculations. Remember when we did the accounting from the lessee's perspective and we said, well, if the lessee doesn't know the lessor's implicit rate, the lessee would use their incremental borrowing rate. Well, we don't have to worry about the lessee's incremental borrowing rate at all because we are doing this from the perspective of the lessor and the lessor is going to know their own implicit interest rate. So we're always going to use that. So this will be 5% in this example to do the discounting. Now, we have a guaranteed residual value of 20000 That means the lessee has guaranteed the lessor that this asset will be worth $20,000 when they return it to the lessor at the end of the lease. Now, there's going to be three payments. We've got three rental payments of $100,000. So it's $100,000 a year. First payment made at the beginning of the year. So day one of the lease, uh, we will have a payment of $100,000. Now, the present value of the rental payments, those three payments of $100,000, if you go three periods, 5%, $100,000 payment, you get $285,941. Now, the present value, the guaranteed residual value, that $20,000, if you take the present value of that, you get $17,277. Why do these numbers matter? If you add together the present value of the rental payments and the present value of the guaranteed residual value, that gives you the fair market value of the asset at the commencement of the lease, 303218 And that also happens to be, this is going to be the amount of our initial lease receivable. Okay, I'm going to show you a table where I'll show you how we calculate the interest revenue for the lessor and so, and so forth. And I'll show you the journal entries, how we would go through this. We are going to book, so, so the sales... In this example, because there's a guaranteed residual value, the sales revenue is also going to be equal to this, 303,218. So when the lessor, at the commencement of the lease, they're going to book a sale of 303,218, and they're also going to recognize cost of goods sold, and that's going to be based on their cost basis, which in this example is, say, 200000 So they're going to recognize $303,218 in sales revenue and 200000 in cost of goods sold upon commencement of the lease. Okay, so they're going to have a selling profit of 103218 and then they're going to recognize interest revenue throughout the lease. I'm, I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay, Now, just uh, we, we had a video where I talked about lease uh, classification for a lessor. This is going to be a finance lease. If you haven't figured it out already from the details I'm going to talk about, this is going to be a finance lease. Uh, I don't want to go too much into the details of that, but just note that the present value of the lease payments amounts to substantially all the, uh, the fair market value, the fair value of the asset. So that would be, that's one of the classification tests for whether it's a finance lease. But you can also just take my word for it in this example. Let's treat this as a finance lease. So I mentioned that we're going to have sales revenue, 303,218. So we can see that here. Um, so 303,218 of sales revenue, that's going to go on the company's income statement, 200,000 of cost of goods sold. Okay. Now, so we're going to have a selling profit of 103,218. Okay, that's the difference between the sales and the cost of goods sold. 103,218. Now, they also need to remove the inventory, right, from their statement of financial position and then record the lease receivable. So, let's think about what's happening here with this finance lease because this wouldn't happen if it was an operating lease. It wouldn't go down this way. What is happening is this piece of equipment or whatever it is that is, is being rented to this lessee, okay, it was in the lessor's inventory and we're saying okay let's take it out of the inventory let's take it off the statement of financial position but so so we're de-recognizing the asset from the lessor is de-recognizing the asset but they're also recognized as lease receivable which again the lease receivable is the lessor is expecting to receive rental payments and then the residual value whatever this thing's going to be worth at the end of the lease term okay so that you add those together you discount them right using that five percent but you add them together and that's where we got this lease receivables so they're expecting to receive rental payments and the residual value okay so this is how this all ties together so the lessor getting rid of inventory adding a lease receivable and then there's going to be a, an effect on the income statement as well now the lease amortization table, we're going to start with a lease receivable, 303218, which I already showed you how we calculated. Okay, and that's that there. So 303218. Now, 
on January 1st, 2022. So here's just to record the sale from the lessor, but I'll show you another minute. In a minute, I'll show you they got to make a journal entry to receive uh, the $100,000 payment, right? Because the lessee makes a payment. So now the lease receivable and immediately on day one goes down to 203-218 because that's 100000 is no longer receivable because the lessee just paid it. So when we're calculating the interest revenue for the lessor, we take this 203-218 times the 5%, and that equals this, 10161 So, in terms of the income statement effect, the lessor, they're going to have $103,218 in selling profit and 10161 in interest revenue for year one of the lease. Year two, they're going to have just the interest revenue, 5669 which is this number right here, times 5%. And uh, so, so basically, they're not going to have any selling profit in year two or year three of the lease. Um, year three, we got the 952. That's this number here times 5%. I'm just trying to show you how all the calculations are made. Now, if we look at the undiscounted lease payments here, we see, okay, there's three payments of 100000 This 20000 at the end is the return. That's the residual value, right? That's the guaranteed residual value. That's the, the, the lessee is returning the asset to the lessor, and it's supposed to have a value of $20,000. Now, I mentioned, so this lease payment, I mentioned there was a journal entry here. So basically, the, the lessor would increase the cash account, decrease the lease, lease receivable. Just remember, look, the lease receivable, it's eventually going to go to zero. Because at the end of the lease term, it's like, okay, the lessee gave the thing back to the lessor. They don't have any more payments that they owe. So this is representing the, the payments they are going to be made plus the um the residual value, what the asset's going to be worth at the end. Now, I also mentioned the interest revenue being recorded. Okay, interest revenue, when that goes up, the lease receivable is going to increase as well. That's why this goes from 203 to 18 to 213, 379, in case you're wondering, like, the math of how this all works out. Okay, so I mentioned already the income statement effect. We've got the 103 to 18 in selling profit, and we have the 10161 in interest revenue. Now, this is assuming that the lessor is a manufacturer or dealer, and so they're selling something, okay? Now, th let's say it's a piece of equipment or something like that. But you could have an arrangement where it's just strictly the lease is a financing arrangement and it's not it's not really a sale, it's not a manufacturer or dealer. Let's say it's a bank, for example, and the lease is basically just a strictly a financing arrangement and there is no selling profit. There is no selling profit, no sale recognized, on the commencement of lease. That's possible, okay, that's normally called a direct financing lease. And so if you had that situation, uh, basically there wouldn't be any uh, sales revenue or, or cost of goods sold. What would happen, what would happen is it basically, so let's say it was a piece of equipment, okay, that the, the bank was uh, leasing out so they would reduce the equipment account, okay, and then they would they'd recognize a lease receivable. But there wouldn't be any sales revenue or cost of goods sold or, or, or anything like that. Then the only profit that would accrue to the bank as the lessor would be the interest, Okay, but when it's when the lessor is a manufacturer or dealer, they're getting the selling profit at the commencement of lease and interest along the way. When it's a direct financing lease, like a bank, and they're not they're not selling inventory, then there's no sale recognized, no selling profit. The the bank is just the lessor is just getting interest revenue as, as the profit along the way. Okay, that's just a little side note. Now the statement of financial position, aka balance sheet, uh, as of uh, December thirty first, twenty twenty two. So I should I should have mentioned up here. Okay, so I've got the dates here, January 1st, 2022. That's the first day of the lease. So right here, December 31st, 2022, we see a lease receivable of 213379 Okay, that's these two added together. Now we've got a current portion and a non-current. The current is the payment that's expected to be received in the next year. Okay, so this is just the financial statement effects for the lessor, like what their financials would look like. Now, year two of the lease, they receive another hundred thousand dollar payment lease receivable goes down pretty straightforward and then the interest revenue i already showed you how that was recognized so for year two at least this is the only thing that would affect the PL statement for the lessors you just have this 5,669 of interest revenue okay there's no selling profit in year two year three uh, we have another payment so we receive cash uh, lease receivable goes down and then we have the um, additional interest revenue Okay, so this would be the only income statement effect for year three for the lessor. Okay, now 
If all goes well, the lessee returns the asset at the end of the lease, the lessor puts it back on their books, so the lessor is going to increase their inventory account when they get the asset back, and then they're going to uh, basically zero out the lease receivable account. Okay? Now, I said if all goes well, because there's a guaranteed residual value of 20000 So the lessee had said, look, this is going to be worth 20000 at the end of the lease. But what if it's not? What if it's not? Uh, so I'll just a little hypothetical scenario here. Let's say that the residual value is actually less than the amount was guaranteed. So if we had the, so the guaranteed residual value was 20000 but let's say the re- actual residual value, like when the lessee gives the asset back, to a lessor, it's only worth 8000 And they're like, well, sorry. Well, hey, you're going to have to do more than sorry because you guaranteed that this thing would be worth 20000 So they're going to have to give $12,000 cash okay, to the lessor. The lessee is going to have to pay out this cash. So the lessor in that case, right, this is the hypothetical scenario, right? This is the final thing in the example I was covering. But I'm saying if it wasn't worth 20000 at the end, then they put it back in their inventory at 8000 So they increase the inventory account by 8000 but also increase the cash count by 12000 because the lessee's giving them 12000 cash to compensate for that, that shortfall. And then they zero out the re- lease receivable account. 